Welcome to the Revenue Builders Podcast, a weekly show featuring B2B sales leaders and executives. Hosted by five-time CRO John McMahon and force management co-founder John Kaplan, the show takes guests in the barrel, behind the scenes with the people who've been there, done that, and seen the results. Revenue Builders covers best practices for scaling and growing your business while sharing the pitfalls to avoid. Great conversation, solid interviews, tangible takeaways to help you succeed. If you enjoy the content, please subscribe, rate, and review the show to help us reach more people. Hello, and welcome to the Revenue Builders Podcast. I'm John Kaplan here with my great friend, five-time CRO and author of the best-selling book, The Qualified Sales Leader, John McMahon. Johnny, how are you? I'm doing great. Doing great this afternoon. How about Good, you? buddy. I'm yeah. doing fantastic, and I'm really excited to introduce our guest here, uh, Kara Bossy. I love that name. It's with B O S S E, so it's Bossy. Kara Bossy is the VP of Sales for M and W Components, and M and W Components is a precision component and product manufacturer and a division of M and W Industries. As a leader of the sales team, Kara focuses on driving year over year growth through new product development, cross-selling, and growing share with existing customers. Kara and her team are a key component or proponent of the remarkable customer experience M&W endeavors to deliver to all customers. They find unique solutions to everyday problems and assist in the creation of repeatable, robust designs that perform in the most exacting applications. Kara has supported M&W's growth for nearly a decade, managing sales operations, strategic accounts uh, across M&W's nationwide footprint. And on weekends, Johnny, you'll find Kara on trail runs, spending time with family, uh, or learning new skills such as the art of Italian cooking. Kara, welcome. And I'd like to introduce you to my buddy, John McMahon. Hey, Kara, how are you? Good, great to have you. Hi, John. Thanks so much for having me. Certainly honored to be talking to you guys today, part of the John Squared Factor. And, <laughs> and Cap, always a lot of jokes about my name. Bossy, I've always been bossy. I'm in the perfect role, apparently. I love that. Leading sales with a name like the boss, the bossy. I just love it. It's awesome. It's hey, let's a big sports facility near where I live in Massachusetts that has uh, it's it's the name of the facility is Bossy, I and mean, it's a pretty big facility. And in fact, I think they have three or four of them. Have you never heard of that, Kara? No kidding. I'd love to cl- lay claim on that, but I don't know that I can. So <laughs> That's great. Just check. Hey, let's get started and just um, if you wouldn't mind giving the audience just kind of a brief explanation of what M&W Components does and, and, you know, the unique position that you have with your customers. And, and then we'll dig into, you know, some of the big topics like supply chain and stuff like that that we want to talk to you about today. So let's get it started with something easy. Yeah, sure. I got to have a lot of fun. Really excited to be on this today, guys. So yeah, MW Components is a manufacturer of precision, highly engineered components, everything from springs to fasteners to bellows, shims, and and other applications. But we service a wide range of industries, everything from industrial, aerospace, a little bit of medical. We do a lot of semiconductor applications, as well as we work through a variety of channels, distribution through contract manufacturers. So it's, it's a really diverse manufacturing organization. We work with large and small customers. Um, but ultimately, that is the most fun part and sometimes the most challenging part to staff a sales organization around that diversity. So, yeah, yeah. So, so the truth be told, uh, Karen and I have discussed this. So, your CEO uh, over on the corporate side is a really good buddy of mine named Simon Newman. And, and um, I also have a very good friend on your board. And when the topic of supply chain came up and you know your you were recommended to us is like some we talk about somebody that's had to deal with with those different industries that you're talking about in those segments and you know with companies trying to sell right now through the you know supply chain challenges i've heard you describe 
the current challenges in the marketplace is managing through a sea of black swans. Could you tell me what you mean by that? Yeah, sure. And look, I won't take any credit for that. Our team kind of came up with that together, right? Yeah. But sometimes you come across, you know, one black swan in the lake, but um, we're, we're seeing quite a few here. And let me tell you, I don't think any individual, even in our personal lives, right, hasn't been impacted by some of these supply chains. I'll, I'll tell you, my husband and I were going out looking for a fridge a few months ago, and they're quoting us, 20 to 22 weeks and the price was only held for like a day. Well, you know, I had to find a way to fill my fridge. So we had to look at an alternative, but, uh, but it's certainly been a challenge and we've, we've definitely been learning a lot along the way. It's been a real test of a lot of our relationships. Um, but we've also been able to expand our relationships as a sales team. So we've really been able to take a negative into a positive, but just kind of, you know, let's start from the beginning, right? So early 2020, we really started going into COVID, right? And during that time, you know, most every company was making adjustments to to headcount, they were on hiring freezes, they're reining in inventory, they're controlling expenses, right? Um, Sales were, were headed in the downward direction. We were seeing shutdowns at facilities because of COVID and because of issues, um, and therefore, we started seeing production issues, particularly on the raw material side, right? Yeah. Um, this was also, you know, taking a lot of people out of the labor market, uh, which was causing, you know, port congestion. And people were really starting to rethink kind of that work-life balance. And so now we're facing a little bit the great resignation, people coming out of the market. They were able to stay home, get unemployment, right? Stimulus checks. And um, and all was well. Well, it's really hard to run a manufacturing facility in oh, yeah. some of those conditions, to say the least, right? Uh, now, fast forward a little bit, right? 2021, we started to see the industrial markets really recover. And I want to say early spring 2021 timeframe. So we saw pushouts starting to become pull-ins. And we had this whipsaw change in demand as an organization that we had to start dealing with. And it was primarily due to the the stimulus. You know, folks had money, they wanted to go out and get a UTV or they wanted to go out and get a John Deere tractor. You know, they they had all this disposable cash that they weren't planning on. Um, So a lot of e-commerce activity, we've got people at home, they're spending a lot of money. And so, you know, we had to start managing these backlogs as they were growing. And we also had to start managing a lot of the panic buying that really started happening when people saw that we weren't staffed at a level within the value chain to really support this really rapid change. So it put us in a spot where we really had to start managing some of these customer relationships and have discussions around, you know, those tough conversations around what do you need? What's the priority here, right? asking for things like better visibility on longer-term POs and material commitments that were previously taboo for many of these customers. So it really drove us into a spot where we had to have some of those tough conversations up front. Um, In the midst of it, right, price was out of control. Folks were holding price for two or three days and, and then changing it again, which, you know, we know in the middle of a negotiation can be a really challenging spot to be in. Let's stay here on let's stay here before we go to pricing because I that just fascinates me on how you would even price things. Before COVID, MW, uh, what was the balance of your manufacturing? Were you all were you manufacturing in the United States? Were you using facilities overseas and shipping back? What was your scenario? Yeah, great question, Cap. So Ultimately, all 22 of our facilities are here uh, in the United States. But as you know, the supply chain is really complex, especially in terms of materials. There's a lot of materials that are being produced overseas, right? So we had to deal with a lot of that discussion, right? Everyone saw the Port of LA uh, for a while there, right? Holy smokes. Yeah. Incredible, right? You could sit there, ride your bike over and and take a look at the, the freight just sitting there, uh, not not coming aboard, right? So it really drove us into a place where 
the amount of communication that we had to have with our customers. And that's really all you can do, right? Being proactive, having those transparent discussions. When no information is provided to people, we always tend to think the worst, right? Yeah. So with, with, with an absence of information, we, we create the worst possible scenario. Um, but it certainly caused a lot of issues throughout the supply chain. And, and we were working to overcome them with that transparency. And frankly, through that transparency, we ended up coming up with a lot of creative solutions, right? Working with your customer and having those tough discussions really put us in a spot where we had a lot of creative solutions. And we made our customers work with us and work for us. You know, some of these champions that we had come and, and over time, um, we really had to put them to the test and ask them for some help. So how, it was did really- not, how did you not, how did you resist? Because I'm thinking about being a U.S. manufacturer and in manufacturing, the lumps that you must have taken over the last 20 years of everything getting sent offshore and people leveraging you against offshore pricing. How did you not resist like sitting in front of your customers and saying, how do you like me now when you're the inshore, you're the inshore uh, provider? I mean, how did you, it, that's got to be a very, uh, a very uh, humbling is not the right word, but you got to be careful because they were probably a little edgy. Many of those customers have sent manufacturing offshore to take advantage of low cost manufacturing. And now, I mean, in it, it's it's the trend, right? I saw Samsung is I can't remember where they're going. Sam, is they're going to Ohio? Samsung's opening up in Ohio, and Intel is opening up a big plant uh, in Texas. So now the trend is to to bring it back inshore. How did you kind of manage that a little bit with the tendency to maybe want to say, "How do you like me now?" <laughs> well, it was hard some days. Let me tell you, but. Uh... <laughs> No, honestly, right? I mean, I just described a little bit this scenario that a lot of us folks were in. And and to your point, Cap, in the midst of all this, we had to deliver new business as well, right? We had to meet our new business targets. And we had people coming out there with feelers on some of these reshoring opportunities. So what we really had to do was segment, right? We had to go back to what matters to us. What does an A opportunity look like? Yeah. What is our ideal customer profile as it relates to it, to this? And, you know, who is here to stay and who is here for just a short-term emergency buy? Because those emergency buys, those decision makers, in some cases, they were the, the top level executives. So there were a few that we took a big swing at because it gave us an inroad into some of those decision makers that we wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to. But it was really about, you know, managing the sales team and going back to segmentation and what do we do best and what does a good customer look like? And and certainly managing the sales morale throughout all that. I, I tell you, we had to bring the sales and operations group closer together than we really ever had, right? That, that cadence between what's going on, what are the talking points I have? Where are my escalation paths? We had to bring the two teams really close together. So it was, it was a great learning and, and bonding experience for sure. What's interesting there is normally you're seeing what type of value you can bring to the customer, which you were doing. But you were also saying, well, in return for this, since I have a whole diverse set of companies that I can do business with, now I want to see which ones are going to stay with me in the long time and bring me the greatest amount of quantifiable value, right? That, and how did you determine that? Did you determine that because it might be a trade-off between some of your existing customers and some new customers? So how did how'd you make that trade-off on which new customers would actually stay with you versus, let's say, use you just in this, in this you know, COVID period? Yeah, and that's a great question. We put a lot of kind of letter of intents and some agreements across the bow to have some of these discussions and say, hey, we're we're happy to help here, right? But we need some longer term commitments here. We also had to do a little bit of, you know, looking at our product mix and understanding the areas where we had the most constraint and, and probably some areas where we didn't, right? Because these products were impacted differently. There were some commodities, let's say titanium, that was substantially harder to procure versus the stainless steel may have been a little bit easier, right? So it was 
really tight communication and cadence between the operation and the sales team to say, hey, we need you to go after this. And this is what we can actually live up to. But then the other thing was just having those tough discussions with the customers to say, hey, we're we're here for you, but we need some kind of commitment beyond this one emergency buy. And, you know, my team had to bring really great information to the table with opportunities that were very well qualified, right? We weren't taking swings at opportunities that that really weren't. But we were looking at, you know, size of opportunity, customer fit, target market fit, you know, margin profile, right? All of those items. That's really where we were placing our, our segmentation around. And I'm assuming those shifted a little bit with with the changes in, in the, with the challenges with the supply chain and what we've been facing over the last year, year or two, those have shifted a little bit that, that those segments or those qualification areas, how did you communicate that to the team and how do, you know, sellers get amnesia, you know, you give them, you give them boundaries and they basically go and they ask for forgiveness in times like this, you know, like in COVID times, we've seen, you know, companies balance innovation. So they want sellers to go out and innovate and they want them to go and they want them to solve customer problems, but you got to deliver against that, against that innovation. So things shifted, uh, areas of focus shifted, pricing points shifted, margin points shifted. How did you get the sales team kind of corralled into here's what a new idea, ideal customer profile is and here's how we're going to qualify that you guys actually do use you use medic don't you we do we do yeah, i love so it. It, it it's great and it's made it's been a game changer john for my team certainly so um so yeah look we came together and did a little bit of brainstorming as a team for you know what are the new criteria how are they going to change into the future, right? And one of those key criteria that seems to be changing with this reshoring trend is risk mitigation and contingency planning, right? A, a supplier that can provide and, and take both of those boxes and one where that really mattered to them and, and therefore they were going to change their purchasing criteria, right? So we came together as a group, we, we rejiggered kind of our criteria, we set it out there as king. And then we also communicated that down to the operation so that we were sure that we were fully aligned. Um, and I tell you what, it's tough to tell the sales team, right? Rain in the selling a little bit, right? You yeah. know, manage the customer relationship. So, you know, we had some morale challenges that we had to get after. And it, it was really just a lot of communication to the team, right? Transparency about the challenges, connection back to the to the mission overall and, and where, where we're going after. Now, Carrie, you talked about the fact that you had to build closer relationship with your customers and have much deeper discussions before you were almost going to commit to them. So have some of those deeper relationships, have they, you know, do they still exist or did customers go back to their old ways and as far as negotiation? Yeah, it seems like there's a little bit of this revolution in supply chain that folks are really rethinking about how they can control and who they want, how they can control the supply chain and who they want to partner with overall. Um, so a lot of these emergency buys, as I mentioned, right, you really got these high level contacts that we've been prospecting for forever. Um, so it was a great opportunity to have a lot of those discussions, whether we were able to say yes or not. So mm -hmm. I, I would say overall, you know, many, many of these team members are staying. And frankly, we're not quite out of this supply chain issue yet. It's it's yeah. starting to somewhat improve, right? Um, and I think there's going to be a shift too once we get out of it in, in a few watchouts that that we really need to go look at as a sales team. Yeah, and the supply chain issues, you mentioned, you know, the congested ports, you mentioned, you know, labor shortages. But what you also read about, if you're not in the middle of it, like you, you read shortage of truck drivers, not enough warehouse space when all this stuff does come in, semiconductor shortage, which I don't think really affects you that much. Um, China COVID shutdowns, but that didn't affect you either, right? That was a positive for you. So of those things, which ones do you think affected you the most? 
it's so right? or do you think they were all so inter intertwined that it was hard to to pinpoint one yeah it's somewhat a convolution of of all those factors together right for the, for the most part as we have domestic manufacturing it was um material supply but I, I tell you what um I think all organizations are looking at their procurement functions and seeing them in a new light going into the future right I mean our team on the procurement side just did, did a phenomenal job in having some of these tough discussions. We really didn't get to too many points where customers were headed to shut down. And we really performed very, very well through that. And I keep telling my team, we've got to go out and make sure to remind our customers how well we supported them throughout some of these challenges. Let's what, talk so about that first. So, yeah, just, go ahead. What is the, you know, now that you have this closer relationship with customers, you calling on customers at a higher level, you're getting bigger commitments. What's the biggest takeaway for you when you look at your sales force that you've, where have you taken them or how, what do you think is the biggest jump the sales force has made of all those issues or, or something else? What is it? That's, that's a great question. I, I think they found that, you know, having some of these tough conversations actually can be used as an opportunity, right? So wonderful. But opening up full kimono, right? Here are some of our challenges and, and uh, this is how we're going to work through them. And what can we do in partnership to really advance these, right? I, I think most uh, team members struggle with having some of those discussions because we want to be pleasers, right? We want to make them happy. And so good. We're, we're, we're tough to have some of it, hard to have some of those tough discussions. So through that process, sorry, Johnny, just uh, closing up on this one. Please. Did you did you find that some of your sales force there was the ones that were always going I'm imagining always comfortable having those tough discussions the ones the bigger part were the ones in the middle that oh you mean I have to have that tough discussion and then there ones probably there's a small percentage that were like I'm never going to have that discussion so is that <laughs> is that pretty close to what happened in your sales force that, that's exactly right, right? And we had to really support those in the middle and the low end with uh, you know, a little bit of scripting, a little bit of training, certainly a lot of bit of coaching, right? To have some of those discussions. And they had to have all the facts at their fingertips, right? So the level of reporting out and information that they had to have to have those discussions was, uh, was something that really transformed some of our data reporting, frankly, right? Some of the, some of the detail that we were able to blast out to those team members to be effective. Like what? What 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 was some of the things you could you brought out? Yeah, so we were able to really transform uh, using some of our material information through the advent of, of Power BI, which you know one of my biggest things as sales folks is what's your number and how you track into it, right? And um, when I started actually in the midst of COVID, I got the chance to travel with a few sales team members and then ended up getting shut down. But I asked every single one of them that question. And frankly, not one single person could answer, which means we weren't really giving them the data that they needed to get in front of their customers. So as a business, we had the opportunity to go through this advent of, of tool optimization, which... Uh, we brought in Power BI and we were able to bring data on the sales side, on the margin side, on the procurement side, what materials are available um, so that when those team members got in front of their customers, they could have those intelligent discussions. And, and now when I ask that question of my team members, they know the answer within a few seconds, which is great. Right. Excellent. John. So you had talked about having tough conversations and how it created opportunities for somebody that maybe has a little bit more experience and is waiting for the opportunity to get leverage back over a customer, um, which can be dangerous. Uh, somebody that is maybe has a little less experience and tends to be more of a pleaser and more of a, I don't want to demean in any way, order taker, but stop me, ma'am. Uh, when you see something you like, make you know just taking kind of the requirements or what have you with what you just talked about introducing data into the conversation you can't help i'm sure but to you have to understand what your customer's going through because you know it could be if and they have to understand 
what you're going through based upon the reality of the environment and having data, the data doesn't lie. If somebody says, I want you to price it at this versus that or whatever, and you just have data that says, here's what the data says for us. And, you know, it's not profitable for us. And you, you'd you never ask them not to be profitable, your customers, and they should never ask you not to be profitable. So are, are you, and, and I, I think I understand where Johnny's going is like, he, he wants to understand what are you learning about these interactions so you can carry it for the next 10 years, not just coming out of COVID and supply chain, what's going to change for the organization and that you're going to reinforce when you get new sellers and that kind of thing. What do you think out of that scenario? What are some of those key takeaways that are going to change how we get close to our customers, how we use data, um, how we negotiate? Give us your thoughts about that. Oh, it's it's a great question, Cap. So I, I would say, you know, a few key takeaways that come to mind is, you know, train for some of those tougher conversations as it relates yeah. to some of these supply chain needs, right? Make sure they're they're fully prepared to have that discussion and have all the facts, right? Um, I, I think that there's this ability to make sure that you're being a little bit more upfront and using some of those discussions to have deeper relationships on some of the challenges that you're having, right? That some level of transparency with customers is is a way that you can both learn and grow together, right? And then I think it's, you know, every day in life, we all have choices on what we're going to do. And we've got to be really tight, always on segmentation. And by the way, segmentation is fluid, right? It changes as your value proposition changes. It changes as the market changes. Um, you've got to be really agile and nimble and able to change some of those qualification factors as the market shifts. Yeah. And how do you, so with all of those things changing, you talked a little bit about sales morale. I want to come back to pricing in just a moment. I'll follow up with that. How do you get sellers to get their pipelines in it because you have it's it's your response and your preparedness for these market changes and then the mobilization of the sales force to be able to go out and okay this is a good opportunity for us and a good opportunity for our customers our pipeline might not be there right now or you've got certain people that have a certain pipe pipeline one way and we okay we can't deliver that business so we're going to shift over to this segment of our business and those people haven't been building that broad pipeline for those other opportunities what have you seen in that of learning lessons who's more adaptable to the changes in market dynamics and who's less adaptable does that make sense it does it's it's a great question i i think ultimately um you've got to be pretty wide and, and robust with your pipeline overall, right? Because you can't fight a bad pipeline. And it really ended up exposing the folks uh, that weren't deep in their pipeline overall, right? In, in some of these cases. So I think that's really what was brought to the forefront during this time. It, it was really just overall depth of, of pipeline. But, you know, in general, it, it just was a lot of, you know, communication with the team, and ensuring that we were celebrating some of those small wins, right? Solving a small problem and, and having a small win and, and reinforcing the team. And, and of course, in the midst of all this too, right? We've got remote work and we've got salespeople who love to get face-to-face -face with customers. Yeah. We've got to sit at home and do this Zoom thing, right? And we're yeah. all learning new skills throughout that. So it really was about, you know, just bringing the teams together, brainstorming in a way um, that was really productive to work as a group and just really increasing that frequency of communication overall. Hey, Carrot, going back to where you said you had to decide what customers you're going to work with and which ones you weren't going to work with. Were there any customers that you said no to mm. and then later came back to you to want to do business under your terms? Yes. <laughs> That's it. That's all I get. Okay. Fine. <laughs> yes. So um, absolutely. Right. And I, I think that's, you know, for me, from a negotiation standpoint, that is the most powerful tactic I ever learned. Right. Feel it, be willing to walk away and be honest that this deal doesn't really make sense. So 
in a few cases, we had to say, hey, this really doesn't make sense for us. And we appreciate the opportunity and we'd love to see more opportunity. But at this point, you know, we can't accept it. Right. So um, and I think that's created that new norm with that customer to say, okay, these are the parameters that we're going to operate under. Right. It's, you know, when you're when you're managing a team, right, you set guidelines, you set parameters that you're going to work under. It's the same thing with customers. Right. This is how we're going to work together. Here are the rules of engagement. And and we're going to work the best we can to, to try to make it work for both sides. But but yeah, I mean, we definitely saw some customers come back. And um, and I think that it, we got more credibility for it. Right. Mm. At, at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, what about the revelation to your sales force? Did that set a new norm amongst your sales force that, you know, we can have these types of discussions? We actually can say no. It could be a powerful word to get the customer to reveal, you know, where their stance really is and that they want to do business with us. That's that's a great point. I, I think the team absolutely, absolutely learned that, you know, these tough conversations frankly, bring you closer as a team, right? All of your champions with all of your customers, they all have a boss, right? And they're all just looking for some information to be shared, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, right? Not every answer has to be the answer they want to hear, especially if you can't deliver against it, right? So those were definitely learning experiences that, hey, we're just dealing with other humans here, right? They understand if they're in the market, they know what's going on. They really just need to answer to the boss, to protect their organizations, and to make the right move. So um, I, I think that was a big epiphany for us. Let's talk about this structure, if you don't mind. Johnny, did you have a follow-up? Sorry. I was just going to say, if you do it in the right way, if you have in those conversations that Kara discussed before, earlier that she was trying to get closer to the customer, if you're really trying to have you know, building a relationship with the customer, letting the customer understand what, what you can do and what you can't do and all those honest discussions. Then it's a little easier to say, okay, this customer doesn't really want to work with me. It's time for me to walk away and then, you know, test, test the field. You it's know, always it has a, to be done in the right way. It's always a pipeline discussion, isn't it, Johnny? Our ability and our comfort level of walking away is always related to pipeline, isn't it? Well, that's the problem with a weak pipeline, right? You it don't is. want to walk away. Yeah. Hey, Kara, so in my experience, and Johnny and I come from manufacturing and engineering software, my experience, uh, I don't know how it is now for M&W, so, but a lot of times the sellers were tied to production facilities. So you had... You had, you either had a centralized sales force, and then you had a dotted line into the production facilities, or they worked for the production facilities, and then you had kind of like a sales leadership that was trying to kind of coordinate all those resources. First of all, first question is, how are you guys set up? Is it centralized sales? I assume so, yes? It is, and um, but we are because of our scope, right? Our yeah. ability from a solution standpoint is to really make the customer's life easier by narrowing down their supply list, right? So the they are centrally uh, located. However, we're selling the entire breadth of the products. Okay, so that means then I'm not tied to one. So if I'm in. Ohio, I'm not tied to the manufacturing facility in Ohio. I can utilize any of our M&W services on any of the 13 plants that we have, right? Okay, Absolutely. got it. Now, what advice do you have where you have people that are set up different ways and, and you're, you're, you're managing multiple masters? So my sales organization is telling me this. My delivery organization is telling me that. Like, what is your experience? And that's a common, it's, it can happen in software, it can happen in services. I'm serving multiple masters as a salesperson and I, I get paid probably on a portion of what I sell and a portion on what gets delivered probably, right? So what are some of the best practices that you've seen in people that are, have you know kind of dotted lines to delivery organizations and sales organizations? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And look, there's always that kind of inherent uh, good, healthy conflict, right, between the sales organization and the operations. But again, I mean, if that communication and this, the strategy and the segmentation is very well aligned, 
there's really no question about what looks good and what doesn't. So I think that's that's part of it. But I I think ultimately, um, I say to my team always, right, that we all have exter- external customers, but we also all have internal customers too, right? So yeah. you've got to find a way to motivate team members beyond just you know your your customers. You you've got to bring the information. You've got to bring your A game in order to get those folks along for the ride, right? And that's really what I look for in a in an individual that can not only influence the customer, but also influence the internal operation to make sure we get it across the finish line. And frankly, that's why I, you know, structure my in- incentive structure like that, because it does create that healthy tension, right? Where mm-hmm. we're working together to try to help the customer not only win the order, but get it out the door. Now, do you still have strong plant manager focus and somebody saying, okay, this is what we produce out of our plant. Kara, you're not selling enough of the stuff that's coming out of my plant. I'm worried about my plant or I'm worried about the components out of my plant. We get like shadow IT in the IT organization. Do you ever get shadow sales where somebody says, look, you're just not supporting my plant and I'm, I, let's make this just relevant for everybody. You could have a, a services organization or in, that are fighting with, you know, the sea levels inside of an organization to say we're going to go out and get our own sales organization because we don't think that you're like. How do you how do you manage all that? <laughs> it's it's not always easy, that's for sure. Um, one way we've been able to successfully do it is bring in some of these product managers, right? Because. The, the structure that we have is really valuable to our customers and very well aligned with our value proposition. Um, but at the end of the day, right, there are still some of these holes where we need to be able to pivot, right? So we've invested in some of these product managers in a way that they both work for the site and work with the outside sales rep, right? They're kind of the conduit between the two. Um, and we especially place those product managers in areas um, where it's a longer sales cycle, where perhaps that product is, is a little underserved within the totality of what we offer, right? So um, we found the best way to kind of deal with that is a little bit of a matrix, right? Because there's no one perfect way to organize. So something always suffers. We know yes. we're organized in a way that services our customer the best and, and drives growth year over year. But um, But this adding of these product managers has really allowed us to to deal with some of those, some of those issues. And who owns the product manager? I do. (laughs) There's the answer. (laughs) I see a big smile on John's face. Yeah. Good for you, Kara. (laughs) Very proactive. Well done. Yes. Hey, so we, we kind of skipped over this. I'm fascinated on some of the stories I've read on pricing in your industry in the last couple of years, like where we could actually get involved with a customer and tell them, that, you know, the pricing is only good for a day or two days. Like, I can't think of a lot of things that I've positively reacted to. I've had people to tell me, hey, this pricing is only good for this day or that day. And normally when people say that to me, I'm just like, whatever. You know, I, I just assume that it's not true. It's like an inexperienced seller telling me something that's, you know, trying to do a hard sell. In your circumstances, it's it's very real because it is dynamic changes in materials and, and that kind of thing. Tell us, give us a story of some of the negotiations. You don't have to mention names, but what are some of the outlandish things that you're experiencing where you're actually telling people, is it, have you done one less than a couple of days where you said the price is only good for experiencing stress for sure. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Well, so, how about it's the best sales tactic possibly to close the order as soon as you can. Right? It's unbelievable. <laughs> but but, but uh, like in the middle of your negotiation, right? You're like, okay, you got to call them and you got to tell them, hey, the pricing's changed. Not that you just gave them, you said two days, but something actually changed and you got to go back and say our bid isn't valid anymore. We got to change the pricing. Does that happen? It, you know, it really did. And it, 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 to your point, it seems like this fallacy and it's almost this, you know, supply and demand equilibrium usually set price. But for some reason in this environment with this crisis, that really wasn't the case, right? It was a day by day thing. 
And it was also some of those labor constraints. They really had to be thoughtful about what orders they were taking. Um, and, and truly, they were having struggles, honestly, by the day. And then in the meantime, the commodities market was shifting every single day, right? So yeah. you've got surcharges out there. They're changing every day. Um, so we absolutely did have to have some of those discussions. And ultimately, we were just really upfront about it. I mean, one big takeaway is just ensuring that you put some of that information into your terms and conditions as well, right? To be to be as uh, uh, you know, be as upfront as possible. The last thing you want to do is get the deal close to the finish line, right? And set new parameters around how this is going to go. Um, so it was just really about being as honest as we can be in this current time. And, and how do the sellers not lose their mind? Like. If I'm a seller and all of a sudden you say, hey, Cap, I know you got that big proposal out there for X. We can't honor it. And you're like, what? Like, talk about seller morale. How do you do that? Yeah, look, it, it was just one of those realities. I started coming into this hating of the word unprecedented, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> all of our suppliers were sending us, we're in unprecedented conditions, right? So, yeah. Um, but yeah, look, it, it, it was ensuring that our team had the right information so that they maintained their credibility throughout the deal. Um, mm-hmm. It's just, it's just was a reality that, that we certainly had to deal with. Right. And in the meantime, to your point, no one wants to drive these trucks, right? You get this poor congestion. So the freight costs ended up getting, that's a big bid. one, isn't it for you? It absolutely is. And the freight costs ended up getting into this bidding war. Like who's yes. going to pay the highest, right? Forget the contract you have. That's null and void in, in these current environments. Who's going to pay the highest? And that's who I'm going to ship to you first. The thing yeah, that I many, learned. Well, how many conversations did you or the CEO or some C-level person have to get involved with when the when the sales rep had to tell the customer that the price changed in order to what you said, you know, maintain the sales rep's credibility? Yeah, a lot of them. I mean, and they got really good support from the facilities as well as the the procurement team who came in and said, "Hey, we are doing everything we can to mitigate this for you." Um, but you know, here's the reality. We shared you know letters and you know other information to really build that, uh, so our customer had good trust in us. But it was it, it was tough, and it was certainly not a, a falsehood. It was just the reality and what we're dealing with. Again, we're we're still a little bit in the middle of this right now. I was just going to say you have yeah. to still be in the middle of this, especially with you know gas and oil prices, and the still ships sitting out and shipping. Yeah, shipping, yeah, shipping and the back of truck drivers. Yeah, it's got to like, be. Like, did problem. you see? Uh, do you see? Uh, I mean, a big part of yours is obviously raw materials that will start to change, but shipping. And the challenges with shipping and getting goods from one, I and just getting prepared for this interview, realizing that that major antiquated deregulation in the 70s and all the stimulus and we don't have enough experienced drivers and the massive difference between the rates, the you know the people that command like 70 cents a mile versus the people that command like 30 cents a mile, and that's a big that's a big difference. So that's not going away. I think I read, Kara and Johnny, yesterday, I think I read, um, when we come out of this, we're going to have, we're still going to be short 160,000 truck drivers, 160,000 truck drivers. That's more than Biden was up talking about on uh, data scientists and cyber uh, security specialists. I think that number was 5,000. And it's a big, it's a big problem in the United States, 160,000 from a, from a truck driver perspective. So I don't mean to, I'm not trying to depress you, Kara, but like, when, <laughs> when do you think you're going to get out of this? Thanks for that, Cap. Yeah, sorry yeah. about that. I just listened to myself <laughs> as I'm talking. Not a very good host. Sorry about that. No, I mean, honestly, I think there will be this new norm slightly, right? Especially from a pricing standpoint, but um at the end of the day, you know, manufacturing has always been an environment where attracting talent, especially young talent, is a is a major challenge for us, right? So, um, and and those were some of the major choke points, right? Beyond the trucking, that the labor being a, a major part in a, in an environment where right. it's really hard to attract talent as it is, right? So and warehousing as well, right? 
Exactly right. So yeah. we're, look, we're we're getting creative, right, with in, in automation solutions and, and things like that. And it's it's really, I think, going to bring about this new uh, era, right, in manufacturing where we've got to find better ways to do this, be, being flexible, being being agile to be able to respond to some of these shifts in the market. Can I expect to see an M and W maybe a uh, health device being sent to my house in the future in a uh, with a drone. There you Probably. go. And there'll, there'll be a lot of springs in it too, Cap. So yeah, that's fun. right. That's right. Hey, let's switch gears really quick because I, I want to another thing that um, I think you just have a really, really obviously you're you're up against it on the supply chain and what you guys are doing is amazing. And and we've appreciated that conversation. Talk to us a little bit about the operating rhythm. You've talked about communication a bunch of times today. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about the management operating rhythm? First of all, what is it for you and how has it changed or how has it been reinforced during times of needing really, really specific communication? First of all, what does a management operating rhythm mean to you? How do you define that? Yeah, well, look, coming from manufacturing, right, the background of that is really Six Sigma, right? And it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a process, Right. So it's really about identifying the business need. And I'm a big proponent of you don't do that on your own because you don't yeah. get, you know, good diversity of thought there. The second is, you know, setting the ground rules for that operating mechanism or cadence. And then the third around an operating rhythm is, you know, how do I get feedback into this process? Because I don't want to introduce operating rhythm just for the sake of, of doing that. Right. So in my mind, operating rhythm is, is everything we do as a team. It's the measures, it's the guidelines, it's the team norms, it's you know the ways we're going to work with each other to you know what is the strategic vision of the organization and, and what are the initiatives really over the next year, over the next three years, over the next five years, right? And a good measure of effectiveness in my mind is you know, you can ask your frontline employees about what is your operating need rhythm, and they can easily say, this is what it is. And by the way, my golden rule is no one's going to supersede it, right? Whether it's my monthly business review, whether it's my, you know, forecast or pipeline review, you know, th this is when it is, and we're going to do it, right? So, um, I really try to connect my team ultimately to the to the why we're doing it. And in, in some cases, I've yeah. been able to bring in our CEO to some of these operating rhythms, which allows the sales team really empowers them and, and gets them really excited about being a part of it. And, you know, this is not just a reporting exercise. This is truly something that is actually going to drive results for me. Right. And I think that's when you end up getting the change. Right. This is not something that's done to me. This is something that's going to make me successful. And in participating in these operating rhythms and cadences, I'm actually going to drive results. You know, that's a big deal. And that, you know, muscle memory through some of these cadences, it really not just drives results, but but productivity. So it's this kind of force multiplier within your team um, for growth. But I think. You know, my goal too in establishing these rhythms is not only do I have them with my team, do I work with the directors on them, but the directors work with their team too, right? Having that rhythm permeate the entire organization is critically important as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I think what's so important is with the operating rhythm is that you're letting other people and other disciplines in the company know what your operating rhythm is. So what you're doing during those days, weeks, months of the year so that they don't, so then you're not grinding gears. They're not asking you to do something that you just don't have time for at that, at that moment of the day or, or that week. Absolutely right. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the biggest lessons learned I had, I, I came in and said, okay, this is kind of what I think the structure is on, you know, how we're going to work with each other, how we're going to hold these NBRs, how we're going to have these pipeline reviews. And, you know, I talked to my team to make sure I had that feedback and buy into it so I could get that permeation throughout the organization. But, you know, I introduced a few things that really didn't work. So I think the biggest lesson learned for me on the operating rhythm side is sometimes they don't work and they're not driving value and they're not driving results, right? In which case, 
you should eliminate it, right? It's not working and it's not adding value to your team or productivity. Yeah. And they'll let you know right away. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. All right, Johnny, I'm going to do a, uh, I'm going to do uh, a summary here. You ready? Sorry. Yeah. All so right. So, yeah, yes. So we, we began the conversation by talking about an incredible analogy of a sea of black swans. It's like a black swan is rare. And then when, but you're talking about a sea of black swans, which, Wait, which I don't is, really understand that whole sea of black, black swans thing. So somebody's going to have to explain that off air or something, because I just don't get that one. Yeah, so so my interpretation you know those was black swans they mate for life. Like you don't want to mess with them. <gasps> yeah, they're they're difficult, but Kara, let's let's just uh, give me some clarification on that. My my feeling was is that they're rare, but what, what we see a sea of black swans, so we have multiple black swans that we're dealing with. Is that kind of the analogy? That's right. That's right. They're they're rarity, but all of the things that could happen did happen, right? Yeah. So we were in uh, really challenged times, to say the least. Yeah, I heard you say that. I'm not sure why John didn't hear you say that, but no, Johnny. Um, you know, I, I was uh, down in South Africa a couple times, and then some guys that I knew they had, you know, homes there, and instead of having guard dogs, they had oh, two yeah. black swans. Yeah, so if you stepped into their territory, those black swans would take care of you. Yes, yes, <laughs> I've seen that on the golf course. And then you talked about communication. You've mentioned communication so many times, and you said communication is a key, not only with customers. You said the best thing you can do is over communicate with customers, no surprises. But you also talked about internally. And when you have a sales organization and a delivery organization or an operations organization or what have you, it don't forget about the power of you know that same level of communication has got to go throughout all. I think one of the ways that you did a great job of <clears throat> of um, navigating the black swans is the segmentation you focused on and sellers, you got to listen up. There's going to be a difference with your A customers and your B customers and your C customers. If you want favor, not favors, if you want um, favor for a customer, you better make them an, an, an A customer. So when you're trying to get your company to do things for B and C customers, based upon certain characteristics that are way, uh, well lined up for ideal customer profile, that's kind of on you as a seller. So you should expect that there's going to be some difference in the way that you respond. You talked about you know risk mitigation and contingency planning really being a part of a big part of your value proposition as you were dealing, um, dealing with your customers. And emergency buys what you talked about was you said in an emergency buy situation, we have the advantages of dealing with economic buyers. I'm paraphrasing that we might not get to in a normal, our executives are talking to their executives and we have this opportunity. It's up to the sales organization to not make that an event, but to continue to make that a process kind of going forward. Once you get that type of interaction, why, why would you just leave it up to COVID or supply chain issues, and then have it just go away. So uh, people that are out there that have got those relationships and they were event-based or emergency-based, we should always look for ways to continue those. Talked about tough conversations, <clears throat> creating opportunities, uh, and also some of the challenges that people that were focused on building relationships without the value first or being more pleaser-oriented. And I'm not talking down about anybody but those people are at risk when tough conversations and tough times are are, are in the mix talked about data and power bi and i just love that because the theme that we've had since we started these podcasts is those that have access to the data have access to better conversations more relevant conversations with their customers and internally your quote that i love i think i'm going to make it into a t-shirt is you can't fight a bad pipeline loved it um and another one for me knowing your walkaway point is one of the most important components of negotiation i think it's so true i think it's so um misunderstood or or not focused on a lot of times i'll see teams getting ready to go and i'll say hey what's your walkaway point and sellers look at me like i'm from mars they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, at what point will we walk away from the business? And they're like, at no point will I walk away from the business. <laughs> and 
it, you know, that's how most sellers, but that's not the reality from a company perspective. So now more than ever, get your negotiation skills really uh, fine-tuned um, with economic headwinds coming for the rest of the world. Uh, that is, you know, in addition to supply chain, I think that, you know, great negotiation skills based on value negotiations is going to be uh, paramount. We talked about services collaboration, uh, balancing the customer need with the delivery capability. And just the way you do that is you communicate, you over communicate. Uh, and then we wound up talking about the operating rhythm. And I love, you know, what a great uh, way for you with your, your experience with Six Sigma. You said it's, it's really nothing more than a powerful Six Sigma exercise. And then you talked about the golden rules, the non-negotiables. I love that because I see operating rhythms that they don't have golden rules. It's like not the same for everybody. I don't have to be there at a planning session. I don't, I got a customer. I got to do this with a customer. I got to do that. And it's like, you know, there's non-negotiables when you're leading these organizations that you have to stay focused on or you can lose the locker room quickly. You talked about connecting the team to a why. And Johnny, that's been a classic theme that we've heard this year since starting this podcast is the most elite leaders we've heard from. They always begin with the why and the what and the how are so much easier. And you talked about making sure that the operating rhythm is done for them, not to them. I want everybody to hear that again. When people believe something's being done for them versus to them, they're much more bought in. And I believe that begins with the why. Johnny brought up the point and Kara solidified it with uh, talking about uh, how she actually uh, operates in these operating rhythms by bringing all the organizations in. Therefore, everybody has to participate in their own in their own rescue. And everybody's a part of that operating rhythm. So it's not just a sales operating rhythm. and being a leader and being honest and open with yourself and probably talking to some of your key people, if it's not working, stop doing it. So the worst thing you can do as a leader in an operating rhythm is continue to ask people to do things that add no value. And it's typically, it's because it's not measured. And when it's not measured, you don't realize that it's not adding value. And then you get the feedback from people that it's not adding value. Johnny, what did I miss? I just like the way that Kara ranked her customers, not through the normal ICP process or ideal customer profile process, but she also looked at not just the monetary value that customers were going to bring her company, yeah. but also the strategic long-term partnership value that they were going to bring. And then ranking those customers based upon that also as a key parameter. I really love that. I like that too, Johnny. And it's your responsibility as the seller. Like, don't abdicate that to anybody else. You should be prepared for, if you want to bring that forth to the company, you want somebody to be that, hey, I believe we should do this for a customer because they're strategic. How many sellers do we hear, Johnny? Oh, this is going to be a really important customer for us. That's why we need to discount 50% or whatever. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about here. We're Just talking about people. having a business focus. Right. Yeah. Okay. Kara, let's play a little rapid fire. Are you ready? Have a little fun. Absolutely. How this about is all your ideal fun. day off of work? <laughs> What's that? How about your ideal day off of work? Uh, it starts with the hike, ends at uh, sunset on the beach. Oh, wow. So you're in the mountains and then you're on the beach? Absolutely. Good for you. And then how about that night? What's your favorite meal? Uh, I, I gotta say, I am Irish. Everything I look forward to every day of the week is corned beef and cabbage. So <laughs> I'm loving that one. Well done, Johnny. I know you love that one. <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. How about the best concert you've ever been to? That's a good one. Uh, probably Tom Petty. Oh, Tom Petty. Did you see him just like a couple of years ago before he passed? I did. Yeah, I did. I did too. It was a great concert. It's great live. Yeah, unbelievable. So, Cap, you want to talk a little bit about uh, the last I will. The la yeah, thanks, Johnny. The last thing uh, we like to ask all of our guests are, is there a favorite charity that, that, you, uh, uh, that you like to bring to the table for us? Yeah, look, I think, you know, for me, it's always about the food and I love to make people happy with food. And I know there's a lot of people out there that don't have access to it. And so 
for me, I, I do a lot of work with feeding, feeding America. Um, and it's, it's one I highly recommend a lot of people here stateside uh, that could use a lot of help. And so the organization, I've heard of it before, but it's just feedamerica.com. We'll get that from you and we'll make sure that we, we put that in the, um, put that in the show notes. So our, our listeners can go take a closer look at that. Hey, Carrie, uh, Johnny's going to wrap up and say goodbye, but I wanted to thank you so much for spending time to uh, talk to us and our audience about, you know, everything that you did and how you transitioned through and are still transitioning through a really tough time. So thank you so much. We're very grateful. Thank you. Yeah, Kara, we, we, uh, we appreciate, I heard such great things about you from Simon and Grant and, and, uh, and then the conversation that we had today and just all the stuff that you're up against and how you guys are still delivering at very high levels is, is just really, really impressive. And thanks for taking time for, for spending that time with us today. And it was a joy getting to know you better. Well done. Thanks, Cap. You're welcome. And thank you all for listening to Revenue Builders. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Be sure to check us out at forcemanagement.com.